Welcome to this, the seventh lecture in our series on the Roosevelt and Reagan presidencies. At the end of our last lecture, we quoted President Roosevelt's address to the American people of May 27, 1941. In it, he had said, the United States would see to it by any means necessary that Britain got its needed lend-lease supplies, that this can be done, it must be done, and it will be done. He also issued what he called a proclamation of unlimited national emergency. In keeping with these messages, the U.S. over the next several months made further decisive moves toward direct involvement in World War II. Getting the Lend-Lease material to Britain meant taking it across an Atlantic Ocean patrolled by German ships and submarines or U-boats. It was the British who had to do this, since the carry provision of previous cash and carry legislation remained in effect despite the enactment of the Lend-Lease Aid Program. But the U.S. provided naval intelligence, naval patrols, and then escorts in order to protect those ships. And that brought us to virtual war with Germany, months before Pearl Harbor, even though neither side declared war until then. The Battle of Britain had been won in 1940 with the Germans' inability to destroy the Royal Air Force, an outcome which made it difficult to invade the country. But now there was the conflict in the Atlantic, by which Germany tried to keep Britain from the American supplies that would continue to sustain it. In April of 1941, a month after passage of Lend-Lease, Roosevelt announced that the U.S. would be occupying Greenland and establishing bases there, in keeping with a new agreement with the Danish government which governed the enormous landmass halfway between our East Coast and Europe. The President also extended the American patrolled security zone eastward in the Atlantic. U.S. ships were, therefore, to inform the British of all German vessels they saw. The situation was indeed a dangerous one. In the first three weeks of May, 20 merchant ships were lost to German submarines in the Atlantic. This struggle is going to be decided in the Atlantic, FDR told Prime Minister Churchill that month. Unless Hitler can win there, he cannot win anywhere in the world. In July of 1941, with Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union now underway, Roosevelt sent several thousand Marines to Iceland. The measure violated a provision in the Selective Service Act, which forbade using grafted troops outside the Western Hemisphere, but the Marines were sent anyway, and the State Department redefined the hemisphere to include Iceland, thus attempting to make it legal. Roosevelt believed it was important to meet with Churchill and discuss the war with him personally. The meeting of the two leaders on the British battleship Prince of Wales off the coast of Maritime Canada symbolized the year-old cooperation, but also the distance between them. During the conference, Churchill repeatedly asked for a declaration of war. Although Roosevelt refused, Churchill reported later to his war cabinet that he had said he would, in Churchill's rendering of Roosevelt's words, wage war but not declare it. He would become more and more provocative and would look for an incident which would justify him in opening hostilities. Roosevelt did agree to provide armed escorts for British convoys as far as Iceland, ship Lend-Lease planes and tanks from the U.S. more quickly, and request additional funding for aid from Congress. Roosevelt and Churchill also sent the Russians a joint statement pledging that they would provide additional assistance to them. The American and British leaders further agreed to what later proved to be a momentous declaration of international principles known as the Atlantic Charter. In it, the U.S. and Britain promised not to grab territory for themselves during the war, endorse self-determination for other nations, and called for a post-war permanent international security system and post-war reductions in armaments. This declaration also announced freedom from want and freedom from fear as goals for the world. Later in the war, the declaration would be cause for friction between the two allies given Churchill's desire to maintain the British Empire and Roosevelt's opposition to that. The Placentia Bay Conference is easily misunderstood as a complete meeting of their minds between Roosevelt and Churchill, but in fact Roosevelt was reluctant in his dealings with the Prime Minister and insistent, as suggested by the Atlantic Charter Statement, to which he got Churchill to agree, that the U.S. would aid only the United Kingdom itself, not the long-term survival of the British Empire. FDR also made it clear that he would hold off on seeking a declaration of war. He made the strength of the anti interventionists in Congress as clear as possible to the Prime Minister. Early in the meeting, an exchange took place which indicates one of the differences in perspective between the two leaders. The President's son, Elliot, who was President, recalled that Roosevelt and Churchill were politely sparring over the issue of American involvement. 
My information, Franklin, the Prime Minister said, according to the younger Roosevelt's account, is that the temper of the American people is strongly in our favor. Churchill then added that they seemed ready to, quote, join the issue, presumably meaning go to war. The President replied, if you're interested in American opinion, I recommend you read the Congressional Record every day, Winston. Roosevelt had in mind not a declaration of war, but the aforementioned Declaration of Principles, the Atlantic Charter, which would shape the war if the United States got involved. Just weeks after the famous conference, however, after the so-called Greer incident in which a German submarine fired at a U.S. warship that was carrying mail, but also helping the British to hunt and attack the U-boat, the President announced a shoot-on-sight policy against German ships, which would apply to the portion of the Atlantic that was necessary, in his words, for American defense. Roosevelt also, of course, had to deal with Japan. A new Japanese government, which took office in 1940, placed the country on a more aggressive path in Southeast Asia. The president responded in July of that year with partial embargoes on Japan that were designed to reduce its capacity for aggression. Although not necessarily a strong enough step to deter the Japanese from expansion, it signaled U.S. hostility and prodded Japan to move aggressively in order to protect its supply lines. An invasion of northern Indochina followed. Roosevelt responded by tightening the embargo and also announcing a large loan to China, Japan's enemy. Two days later, Japan joined with Germany and Italy as an ally. Despite these developments, peace remained possible between the two countries. The government in Tokyo was divided between a more warlike faction and supporters of peace, a situation which American policies in this crucial period may not have taken sufficiently into account. In early 1941, Japan sent a new ambassador to the U.S. who was interested in improving relations in order to prevent war, and his relationship with Roosevelt, whom he had known previously, began well. However, with the German invasion of the Soviet Union in the middle of the year, the Japanese foreign minister believed the country should ally with Germany and that the Axis Pact, Japan's agreement with Germany and Italy, should take precedence over its recently concluded neutrality agreement with Russia. Japan's move into China in mid-1941, following Hitler's invasion of Germany, led Roosevelt to freeze Japanese assets in the United States. Although this would not include oil and gasoline, the freeze turned into a de facto oil embargo because a hawkish State Department official, Dean Acheson, refused to permit Japan export licenses for the purpose of buying more of the commodity from the U.S. Roosevelt feared that reversing what was now American policy would be seen as appeasement. A poll in September indicated that 67% of Americans thought the U.S. should risk war with Japan rather than allow it to become more powerful. Attempts by the peace-minded Prince Konoye, the country's prime minister, and American ambassador Joseph Grew to achieve reconciliation between Japan and the United States were opposed by key officials such as Secretary of War Stimson and Treasury Secretary Morgenthau, even though the president himself wished to pursue the initiative. Another top official, Secretary of State Cordell Hull, thought along the same lines as Stimson and Morgenthau. Indeed, Hull feared that, in his words, an agreement with the Japanese would be a second Munich. By early November, Ambassador Grew was warning that Japan, quote, may go all out in a do-or-die effort to render herself invulnerable to foreign economic pressures, adding that this was actually probable. After Pearl Harbor, the Japanese, within a matter of weeks, captured Hong Kong, Guam, and several islands in the South Pacific. They also moved into Burma and Malaya, advancing there too with little difficulty. The fall of Singapore at the tip of the Malay Peninsula in February 1942 was a major event in the shift of power from Britain to America, since the now painfully evident British military weakness in Southeast Asia required that the U.S. take the lead in protecting Australia and other countries on which the Japanese had designs. The Japanese also captured the oil-rich Dutch East Indies, now known as Indonesia. The subtitle of our course, The Making of an American Century, refers to several forms of American power, and one of these was our industrial might. In a speech before Congress on January 6, 1942, Roosevelt set out ambitious production goals for the war effort. In the first year of the war, he said, the U.S. would aim to build 60,000 airplanes, 45,000 tanks, 20,000 anti-aircraft guns, and 6 million tons of merchant shipping. 
The night before the speech, his aide Harry Hopkins found it hard to believe that these were realistic production targets. The president's response, oh, the production people can do it if they really try. Although these numbers were later reduced, Roosevelt's initial reaction is indicative of the American spirit in this era. Eventually, the U.S. would be able to produce 300,000 military aircraft, 2.4 million trucks, 635,000 jeeps, 88,000 tanks, 5,800 ships, and 40 billion rounds of ammunition. Early in the war, the Allies had to make a major decision about how to attack Nazi-occupied Europe. One option was to open what was often called a second front, a second front that is for the Germans to deal with, in addition to the front in the Soviet Union. And this required that the American, British, and Canadian troops land on the heavily fortified French coast in the face of tremendous German firepower. Roosevelt was told by Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov on the latter's visit to Washington in mid-1942 that if the Allies landed in France, the Germans would have to divert 40 divisions from their Russian invasion in order to stop them. Molotov also noted that by 1943, if the Second Front invasion of Western Europe were delayed by a year, the Soviet resistance to the German armies on the Eastern Front might have collapsed by that time. The Western Allies in that case would be left to fight most of the war without the Russians. Roosevelt was sympathetic to these concerns. He had recently written to General George Marshall and Admiral Ernest King that, quote, Russian armies are killing more Germans and destroying more Axis materiel than all of the other allies combined. After consulting with Marshall, the president told Molotov he could tell Stalin that, quote, we expect the formation of a second front this year. In order to do that, however, it would be necessary to cut America's supplies to the Soviet Union so the contemplated invasion of Western Europe could be adequately equipped. The British were upset by Roosevelt's assurance to Moscow. In July of that year, Churchill argued strongly against such an attempt. More time was needed. There was a severe shortage of landing craft, American troops were ill-prepared, and the British troops were stretched too thin. An invaded French coast, furthermore, would be easily reinforceable from Germany. The Prime Minister proposed instead an invasion of North Africa, the western part of which had few German troops. Although this would be less helpful to the besieged Soviet Union, it would cost many fewer lives than an invasion of France and would place pressure on the enemy's vulnerable Mediterranean flank. This would, Churchill said, be, quote, the safest and most fruitful way in which to open a second front. Another consideration for Roosevelt was that the British Army was so hard-pressed further east in North Africa by German forces under General Erwin Rommel. In a series of intensive White House meetings, General Marshall and Admiral King continued to advocate vigorously for an invasion across the English Channel, but Roosevelt was not convinced, and indeed he had already indicated concerns about such an attempt to invade Europe. The President also believed, however, that American troops must begin to fight the Germans as soon as possible in order to hold off public pressure to fight harder against the Japanese against whom the public wanted vengeance for Pearl Harbor. There is much to be said for Roosevelt's decision that the Allies should invade North Africa. According to historian Nigel Hamilton, the invasion of November 1942 meant Hitler's troops would be fighting the Allies, quote, on the periphery of Europe, at the very farthest point from his own bases and supplies, while all the time having to hold significant German forces in France to meet a possible cross-channel invasion from Britain, which could, after all, come later. Against slight resistance by troops commanded by the government of German-occupied France in North Africa, the American and British troops landed. Although there was much criticism of the decision to collaborate with the French Vichy regime officials who governed North West Africa and were neither friends nor enemies of the U.S., Roosevelt thought the alternative, fighting their troops, would be unacceptable. Not only would Allied casualties have been heavy, but public opinion in France would have turned more hostile to the Allies. The U.S. now also reaped the benefits of Roosevelt's previous refusal to break off relations with the Vichy French government, despite its collaboration with the German occupiers of its country. Indeed, good enough relations were maintained that the President was assured by the Commander-in-Chief of the Vichy forces, Admiral Darlon, that if the Allies landed with enough strength in North Africa to successfully fight the Germans, 
his troops would not interfere. The North African invasion did indeed bear fruit in a variety of ways. It proved difficult for Hitler to maintain a strong German position in the complicated naval environment of the Mediterranean Sea. Historian Douglas Porch writes, quote, the requirement to support Axis forces around the Mediterranean enabled the Allies to apply their maritime superiority against Axis weakness. The Italians forfeited their merchant fleet and much of their navy trying to ferry supplies to North Africa. On land, the North African campaign allowed the Allies to experiment with fighting techniques against one of Germany's best field commanders, namely Rommel. Ultimately, Porch maintains, the North African campaign helped the Allies to identify their most able commanders, bought time to build up an unstoppable superiority of materiel for war in Europe, and helped the Allies begin an offensive in the Mediterranean region that took them to Tunisia, Sicily, Italy, and ultimately into southern France. In our next and final lecture on the Roosevelt presidency, we will discuss the rest of World War II, including domestic issues such as the internment of Japanese Americans and diplomatic controversies, especially involving policy toward the Soviet Union toward the end of the war. Thanks for listening.